Gentlemen, to, to remove everybody who would like to find a seat. Uh, I think there's plenty of seats. There's even some some special seats upstairs in the balcony. If you want to sit by yourself, you can sit up there. <laughs> I'm sure. And I think there's even uh, special cookies and coffee up there uh, for anybody who wants them. So thank you very much for coming uh, this evening uh, to hear our special guest, Mike Rosen. And, uh, and to share in our values for the Evergreen Tea Party. My name is Ed Sutton. Uh, I'm the president of the Evergreen Tea Party, and I get to do a lot of the fun things like empty the waste baskets and well, set up chairs, those kinds of things. So, uh, but it's a, it's a great uh, evening for all of us. And uh, we'll start the meeting this evening uh, with a uh, short uh, prayer by Ron Lewis. Might be a long prayer. <laughs> well, Ed is welcome here to the barn. And I'd like to extend that, but um, I'd like to make you join me and welcome my Lord I'm here this evening too. Would you stand with me, please? Good evening, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to come and celebrate freedom. And we're very appreciative of the couple of inches of moisture you brought to us. And you gave it to us freely to help us to remember that there are responsibilities of how we deal with that water. And that was given freely, but there's ways to employ that and it sort of doesn't become destructive. And Father, we thank you for the freedom that we've inherited. Very few of us have paid the price for freedom. But with there comes the cost of eternal vigilance. Help us to and deal with our freedom wisely. And this evening we would pray for those in authority, as Scripture tells us. And we pray for our president, his cabinet, those he's appointed, our Congress, the House, Father, that uh, we know that you control uh, the head of the king and you turn it the way that you'd like to have it go. So we, we pray that their decisions might be in the best interest of this freedom we have, a country that you've given us to be responsible for, uh, visit with us this night. Uh, bless us, for we pray to Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Ron. Uh, we'll next, uh, have the Pledge of Allegiance uh, and uh, Tony Sanchez, our uh, candidate for Senate District 22, will lead us to the Pledge of Allegiance. Tony. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you again for coming. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing this evening. Uh, we have a little bit of, uh, of Evergreen Tea Party business that you're going to get to take part in. Uh, but before that, we have a, a very special announcement uh, and it's something that's happened recently uh, in Jefferson County, which is important to every one of us, which some of you are familiar with. And uh, I've asked John Newkirk, uh, who is our uh, board member of the Chester County School Board, uh, one of our newly elected members, and uh, to uh, elected for the purpose of reforming education in Jefferson County. And John has a message for you this evening. John, please come up. Well, thank you, Ed, and thanks to all of you for coming out and braving this unexpected snowstorm of 12 inches outside. No one expected this. No one expected this. And that's exactly what they were saying down at Union headquarters about six months ago. And when, for the first time in recent memory, uh, the board majority 
uh, was of non-union endorsed candidates. So, a little update as, as Ed was talking about. Uh, it's been uh, a long six months. It's been a tough six months. But we have gotten some good things done, and I recognize some familiar and friendly faces in this audience tonight. So thank you very much for everything that you've done and everything that you did to uh, help us get elected. A uh, couple of things we did. Uh, number one, we stopped a controversial data mining program that was taking sensitive data from our children and uploading it to a national cloud. It was called InBloom. The keyword was, because it is no more. We have begun the road to equalization to our over 6,000 charter students in Jefferson County and our 15 charter schools. We're not done yet, but we've taken the first step. But most importantly, in the last couple of days, we have announced a finalist for superintendent. Now, uh, this gentleman is, uh, well, first of all, let me tell you a little bit about the process. We hired a national search firm. And Jefferson County got over 250 inquiries about taking this job. We narrowed that down to about 65 and actually submitted applications. Out of those 65, a search firm narrowed it down further to about a dozen. And then we interviewed about half of that number just a few days ago. And from all of that, has funneled down one particular gentleman who finally got Well, here, let me start with this. He's technically a finalist, so we have 14 days, and he's going to go around and be talking to people. His name is Daniel McMinnemy, and out of over 60 applicants, and these ones that we interviewed, despite a connection I'll tell you about in just a minute, he's the final pick, because he has such a solid background. He's a traditional candidate. They have no need to be trained in education, school finance, use of data, or any other areas of education. This is what placed them above some of the very excellent non-traditional candidates. It was a clear choice in terms of qualifications. It would have been unfair to bypass him just because he happened to work in Douglas County. Now, Daniel McMenemy was in Douglas County before the new conservative board was elected a few years ago, and before Dr. Liz Fagan arrived in the district. Prior to that, he worked in Oregon. He was a principal, he was a teacher, he was a coach there. Now, I didn't know this gentleman until he was brought to my attention by the search firm. But as time goes on, I'm more and more sure that we made the right choice. Now, I was enthusiastic about him because he shares my vision for solid, data-driven decision-making. He provides more direct control of education at the building level, at the local level, encouraging genuine transparency and parental involvement and intentional development of genuine educational options for all students. He showed great integrity and a willingness to confront the concerns of our district in a truthful manner. So I'm very excited about bringing this gentleman on board. Oh, and by the way, he also happened to be the lead negotiator during the 2012 talks when the Dove Cove School Board decided not to renew their contract with the Teachers Union. Okay. So you will be hearing a lot of controversy in the next few weeks. But I guarantee you this is a solid, solid person. I'm very excited to work with Mr. Daniel McKinney. All right, again, I want to thank everybody here for all your involvement and for coming out today and for supporting us and continuing to support us over the next three and a half years of our term. Thank you very much. Well, we're on this subject, and uh, while Mike Rosen is standing over there watching and listening, uh, you probably remember listening to Mike Rosen and the multiple guests he's had on his show from Douglas County, including president of the school board, school board members, and other people, uh, while Jefferson County was going through this reform transition. And Mike was not only extremely supportive of that, uh, but also very supportive of Jefferson County Students First and our new, newly uh, uh, elected board members uh, uh, and to support them and to carry out their 
the reform measures that the voters elected them to carry out. So uh, uh, it does pay off, Mike, and thank you for doing that. Uh, our next uh, uh, item on the agenda is a little bit of uh, Evergreen Tea Party business. And I wanted to tell you briefly about what our uh, three objectives are for 2014 for the Evergreen Tea Party. Uh, the first objective, objective is to support electable conservative candidates with constitutional values. Our first objective, and the fact that we have an election coming up in 2014, that's our number one objective. Our second objective is to participate in and promote Article 5 Convention of the States. Uh, if you are all familiar with that, um, you understand what it is. If you don't know, uh, you can educate yourself very quickly by going on to our Evergreen Tea Party website and clicking on links, and you will find a syllabus there of information that gives you pro and con information on the Convention of the States. Uh, extremely important, I'll tell you more about it a little bit later. The third item is establish, promote, and staff the Evergreen Education Center. Uh, and I'll tell you why we're doing that also. So on the first objective, I would just like to mention, I'm going to run through this quickly, but you're all familiar mostly with the candidates uh, that we have. Um, and uh, you're familiar with the assemblies and the results of uh, how the delegates at those assemblies uh, elected those uh, uh, candidates. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through that because there's so many. But I would like to point out that on June 24th, when we have the primary election, that we are going to have a primary for sheriff, where Jeff Schrader and Jim Shire will be in that primary. We will have a primary for county assessor, for Louis Diario, and Ronald Sandstrom will be uh, in that primary. We will also have a, uh, as you know very well, a primary for governor. And we have the four gubernatorial candidates, Mike Cobb, Scott Gessler, Bob Beaupre, and Tom Tancredo, the last two petitioned onto the ballot. And of course, we will have uh, a primary for uh, House District 22 uh, between Justin Everett and Lauren Bauman. And the last one, the second of the last one, excuse me, is uh, Senate District 19 for, with Laura Woods and Lang Sias. And I'm sure that Mike will be talking about that tonight. And the last one is Senate District 22, Tony Sanchez and Mario Nicholas. So that's where our focus is right now on those primaries and uh, uh, hoping that we select the most electable conservative candidate uh, for, uh, to run in the uh, election on November 4th. So that's one of our focuses I just mentioned. The second objective that we have is participate and, in and promote Article 5 Convention of the States. Uh, is there anybody here, is everybody familiar with, let's say, uh, you know what Article 5 is? Of the Constitution, Article 5 of the Constitution. Good, we got some people with any things. Uh, this is probably uh, uh, the, one of the most important elements of the Constitution. It's the last thing that the framers of the Constitution wrote. And what Article 5 does is, separate from Congress amending the Constitution, this allows for, provides for the states to amend the Constitution through a, uh, a uh, ratification by the 38 states uh, to, uh, to change the Constitution. Uh, so I urge you very strongly to learn more about this. This is a movement that's sweeping across America. Uh, the framers of our Constitution gave us Article 5 to address the various problems we have today, which are abuses of the Constitution, that have been growing exponentially for the last 100 years. Uh, all three branches of government 
uh, continue to violate the Constitution. It's highly unlikely that restoration of the Constitution will be accomplished by Congress. And history tells us conservative electoral gains will only be temporary without restoration of the Constitution. So that's the second objective that we're working on for 2014. The third objective is to establish, promote, and staff the edu edu Evergreen Education Center. Excuse me. And the reason for that is, is that let's say that we're successful in, uh, in winning these elections that we've all been working so hard on. That is to bring in conservative candidates who win, go into office, and support strong conservative values, support individual liberties, support free markets, support smaller government, support secure borders, and support a strong national defense. Let's say we're successful in doing that. And we have been successful in the past in doing that. But it's also we've learned that without major without major changes in Congress, we're going to be it's going to be very difficult to turn the country around. And one of the purposes, the second objective is, is to get our nation to focus on the use of Article Five, Convention of the States, to restore the Constitution. Not necessarily to change it, but to restore it. The third, if we're, if we're successful in the first one, electing our conservative candidates, and we are even elect successful in the second one, but through the Convention of the States, all is for naught unless we provide our young people that are growing up in our high schools a basic foundation, the fundamentals of the Constitution and what made this country great and what provided all these liberties and the freedoms that we have in the free market. So, at the uh, Evergreen Education Center, which we have opened up and which uh, we have uh, a lot of great materials that are available, we want to start providing courses to young people, high school students, in American history and economics, the Constitution, and provide courses in government for what we used to call civics, and also provide a course in how to manage your money, how to find work you love, and how to prepare for your career. So uh, if, we don't, if we don't start providing that kind of uh, information and that teaching to young people, the gains that we have are only going to be temporary. Uh, we need to have young people coming into voting age that understand and have the values that treasure the, uh, what made this country great and provided them everything that we've had in the past. So those are our three objectives for 2014. If you are interested in working with us on any of those, uh, take a look at the uh, uh, volunteer poster over here. There's a number of positions we have open. We have, uh, you know, we're not like the nation. We have a very, very uh, low unemployment rate. So <laughs> we'd be very happy to join up uh, as a volunteer. Uh, and the second thing is, is that take a look at the education center needs, some of the things that we need over there. If you have any of those things, uh, please uh, uh, donate them. And uh, the third thing you can look at is our movie night entertainment that we do once a month. You'll see a poster up for that. I think it was it's right here behind the speaker now. And uh, you can see uh, some of the movies that we've been showing. That's free to all members to come once a month. And we've done a, a quite a few films, uh, uh, Atlas Shrugged 1, Atlas Shrugged 2, uh, Fountainhead. We have a bunch of uh, Iron Rand junkies and object, objecting to the thinkers that come to these movies. It's kind of fun. So, uh, at this point uh, in our meeting, uh, I would like to do the next thing and what you all came here for, and that is to introduce Mike Rosen. But before I have you come up here, I'm going to talk about Mike a little bit because uh, most of you know him, and most of you have listened to him on the radio, but uh, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit about Mike. Uh, like me, many of you listened to Mike uh, talk show for years. 
The first time I heard Mike speak in person was at the leadership program of the Rockies retreat this February. I've heard him on the radio many times, but never in person. At this event, uh, Mike spoke individually and also appeared with three other speakers on a panel. And that panel of speakers was David Horowitz. Many of you know David Horowitz and a former uh, communist and publisher of the New Left Communist newspaper and now a nationally famous uh, speaker and writer, very conservative. And Matt Kibbe was another one of the panelists, president and CEO of Freedom Works, nationally recognized policy expert and senior fellow at the Austrian Economic Center. Third one was Jeffrey Lord, co-chair of the Reagan campaign and member of the Reagan administration. The reason I mention you these three people is that, is that these are the kind of people that the leadership program that Rob Keys chose to be on this panel with Mike Rosen. They're all thought leaders, including Mike. And uh, it was very interesting to listen to the three of them talk about coalition politics. And the, the uh, name of the panel was, for that evening, uh, the GOP and the Tea Party, Can This Marriage Last? And again, it was about coalition politics. And one of the most interesting things about that, that whole two days, was it was all about this, is what kind of influence the Tea Party was having on the conservative movement in America, and about coalition politics. So Mike, like his counterparts at the LPR event, as I mentioned, is a thought leader. And after uh, listening to Mike for 25 years, I consider him an objectivist thinker. Am I okay with that, Mike? And, uh, and after an entertainer and a modern-day professor who conducts his classes on the radio. And that's where I've always been educated on a lot of things about economics, government, and politics, and listening to Mike for 25 years. Uh, my phone is ringing here, and I forgot to turn the darn thing off. <laughs> I apologize. I don't know who this could possibly be calling me, but anyway, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, in addition to Mike's work as a nationally top-ranked radio talk show host, Mike, uh, and many of you know this, writes a weekly opinion column, The Rosen Files for the Denver Post. Mike has been a regular commentator on Denver television stations and his articles have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, National Review, Washington Times. Uh, Mike has appeared on Good Morning America, The Larry King Live Show, Hannity and Combs, CNN Tonight, and National Public Radio, I don't know how he ever got on there, <laughs> as a political analyst. And Mike has been a guest host for Rush Limbaugh on the Rush Limbaugh Show. Uh, a little bit about Mike that most of us don't know, uh, uh, his life prior to becoming a, a nationally recognized talk, radio talk show host is uh, Mike holds an MBA from the University of Denver and he worked as a finance executive for Samsonite and also for Beatrice Foods. Mike is also a veteran of the U.S. Army and served as special assistant for financial management to the assistant secretary of the Navy at the Pentagon. I would like to add uh, that it is because of Mike's generosity in adjusting his normal speaking fee to meet our budget that we are able to have Mike as our featured speaker this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mike Rose. Thank you.
<laughs> so my, my first year here was in February, and that was one of the toughest winters we had. Snow was on the ground in Denver for four or five weeks. And early in May, as a rookie to Colorado, somebody proposed a bet to me. It was 80 some odd degrees early in May, and this fellow, knowing he had a live one in front of him, said, I bet you it snows before the end of the night. I said, come on, it's like the snow is 82 degrees, I'm playing golf tomorrow. So I made the bet, and about a week later I had to pay off the bet because it snowed. <laughs> I hadn't planned on starting with this, but I will, I think it's worth a few minutes. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to talk for about a half an hour, and then leave as much time as you guys would like for a, 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 a vivid Q&A. I'm sure there are a lot of people with strong opinions here. If you didn't have strong opinions and you weren't actively involved, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be here. But I did want to say something about the Jeffco School District. About 20 years ago, for one brief shining moment, to borrow that phrase from Camelot, I supported some candidates running for school board in Jeffco, the state's largest school district, who were conservative. And a conservative majority actually won. That was about 20 years ago. That reign was very short life. It lasted two years. Two years later, in the next election, the teachers' union staged a counterattack and swept enough seats on the board in order to put the conservative majority in the minority. And it's been all these years since we've had another conservative majority in the Jetco School Board. We have the model of the Dugco School Board, but Dugco is much friendlier turf for Republicans and conservatives than Jefferson County is. So it wasn't a great surprise that that slate that was successful in Dugco won. It was something of a surprise that the Jeffco conservative slate won. Now, as I said, Jeffco is the largest school district in the state. After the Dugco School Board waved goodbye to the teachers' union, and after a conservative majority won in Jeffco, and by the way, in Adams Five Star as well, the teachers' union in Colorado, the Colorado Education Association primarily, since uh, their affiliate is the union in Jeffco, also the Colorado Federation of Teachers, which is associated with the American Federation of Teachers, which is the second largest teachers' union in the country. The teachers' union in Colorado is going to stage a vicious counterattack for the first opportunity to take control of the school board again in Jefferson County. When I talk about public education issues on the air, one point I've made, the coalition that produces, in swing districts at least, a majority on the school board that's friendly to the teachers' union, can't consist only of people who work for a school district. There aren't enough of them. Although their turnout is obviously much higher than among people who don't work for the school district. They need enough parents to go along with them. And this is where even in Douglas County, solidly Republican in Douglas County, when the school board was able to maintain its majority in the last election, it only did so by a few percentage points. Because a huge swath of parents don't know the difference between that very sweet young woman who lives next door, who's a teacher, and the collective agenda, attitude, and ruthless power of the teachers' union. They, they divorce individual teachers from the power of that collective, the teachers' union. And I coined an expression to describe these well-intentioned parents, mostly women, who are enthralled with the teachers so much that they wind up at the same time supporting the agenda of the teachers' union. And I refer to them as people afflicted with chronic adult teacher pet syndrome. <laughs> now, it doesn't roll off your, your tongue, those words. And one of my listeners once said, well, it's an acronym, Mike, why don't you pronounce it? And I said, I don't know how to pronounce it. Chronic Adult Teacher's Pet Syndrome, C-A-T-P-S. Cat piss. <laughs> <laughs> I never intended that. I don't know how to make that connection, but it, it does serve as sort of a mnemonic, so you can you know, get the term. Uh, so John Newkirk and, and the other two conservatives on the Jeffco board are up against a hell of a fight. 
Now, uh, John, they can't get it back in the next election, right? Because there are only five board members, and, and the three of you are all good for more than two years. Is that correct? Four years. Good four years. Uh, but this school board majority was tried and convicted by that pro-union coalition before they even took office. Mm -hmm. now, the battle was waged during the campaign, but the same people have been on them like white on rice ever since. They certainly haven't given them any time to produce results. Uh, this, this silly complaint they level at this new school board majority, that they're not transparent enough. The prior board was the one that refused to open the negotiations with the teachers union but to the public. How can you be less transparent than that? And this game that was played where the union walked out of negotiations on the contract, forcing under the law, forcing that it goes to a mediator and that it not be public, is a classic example of their hypocrisy. In any event, you're going to see an all-out war, the uh, fruits of which, if the teachers' union side wins, will be seen four years from now, or at least four years from last November's election. They're doing very important work at Jeffco, but getting through to that naive element of the electorate <laughs> is very difficult to do. Somebody sent me an email with an attachment. It was about a five-page letter written by a teacher in Jeffco. I suspect some of you have seen it. And the person asked me to deconstruct it on the air, one of my loyal listeners. It would take me two hours to deconstruct that on the air. I couldn't begin to do it, but I've touched on so many of those points in the future. And it's all about, you've heard the line is for the children. Yeah. Give me a break. It's all about the rank and file. That's what it's about. And teacher unions are a collective. As Albert Shanker, who was once the head of the American Federation of Teachers, uh, said, when school kids start paying union dues, then I'll represent their interests. He said that candidly, but he actually said it. I remember that name, Albert Shanker, because when I was a little kid growing up in New York City in the 1950s in Brooklyn, Albert Shanker was the head of the teachers, the local teachers union. Uh, he later went on to be the head of the national teachers union. Any labor union, and, and think, about, think about the assembly line model, where a labor union is representing unskilled workers, United Auto Workers, for example. The last thing a union wants is competition among its members, which is why they like a collective compensation model, where everybody's paid the same based on seniority. And of course, that's the way it works with educators in Colorado and all over the country. It's a matrix, two axes. One is years of service, the other is degree credentials, postgraduate degree credentials. And everybody makes the same. The best teachers and the worst teachers make the same based on those two variables. And the teachers union doesn't want it any other way than that. Then, of course, they have these sham merit pay plans like they do in Denver. It's not a merit pay plan, a merit pay plan has an administrator or manager appraising all the people who work for that manager and then awarding bigger raises to the best, <coughs> smaller raises to the mediocre, and no raises to the, the least of them. Uh, the Denver Merit System gives bonuses by building. That is, if your school building satisfies certain criteria, certain goals, everybody in the building gets a bonus. That's not a merit pay system, but they call it that. Alright, I digress. I just want to Give my uh, thumbs up to, to John and the rest of that Jeffco School Board. Best of luck to you. In 2010, about three and a half years ago, just before the election, five or six weeks before the election, I wrote a column that never posted. And it was an open letter to Tea Parties. Now let me read some of what I had to say in that column. I said, while I'm not a card-carrying member of your movement, I enthusiastically support and applaud it. My activism is in the war of ideas, and it takes the form of a radio show and a newspaper column. I seek to inform and influence public opinion at what you might call the wholesale level. Yours, in this open letter to the Tea Partiers, yours is at the grassroots level, and it's been invaluable in this election year. Call that politics at the retail level. 
After their victory in November 2008, remember I'm writing this in September 2010, Obamanistas and Democrats imagined they might rule for a thousand years. Somebody else wants to use that expression. <laughs> I'm not comparing the two. Now, two years later, they found themselves in retreat and on the defensive. They grossly misread their electoral mandate and overreached. Their crusade, as Obama phrased it, to transform America. Let me stop right there. What did he mean when he said transform America? He said fundamentally transform America. What are our fundamental documents? The Declaration of Independence? The Constitution? He wants to fundamentally transform them? I don't want to see them fundamentally transformed. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see them follow far more than they already are. Yeah. In any event, that was his agenda, to fundamentally transform America. Into what? Into a paradise on earth of democratic socialism and world government. He didn't put it in those terms, but obviously that's the direction we're moving in. And that's his goal. Well, remember again, I was writing this two years after his election and just before the 2010 election, and I, I noted that this agenda at least appears to have been somewhat stalled. And to the Tea Party, I said, you represent millions of Americans, including many that voted for Democrats in 2008, who recognize that this president and his majority in both houses of Congress, back in 2008 before the election, had overreached. And I said, now the task is first to block any further damage from leftists who have been in power for the past two years, and second, to reverse and repeal policies and programs that they've set in motion. Victory is at hand, I said, just six weeks before the November 2010 election. It's essential that we don't let it slip away. You might recall that in 2010, Republicans regained a majority in the U.S. House of Representatives. One they had lost in the middle of George W. Bush's second term. They lost their majority in 2006, and it fell away even more after the 2008 election. But miraculously, who would have thought, who would have thought Republicans could possibly have won the House back in 2010? But they did. I then said in this open letter to the Tea Party, Democrats and media liberals have denigrated your movement from the beginning. Initially, they dismissed you as irrelevant and inconsequential. They ridiculed you and denied your grassroots spontaneity and legitimacy. They branded you an astroturf movement. Remember that term they used? Not a real grassroots movement, an astroturf movement. As if you've been recruited by secret manipulators. Ironically, this is a tactic that their side employs, such as ACORN paying people to show up at stage public demonstrations and labor unions paying people minimum wage who aren't in a union themselves to show up at union demonstrations. As the size and impact of your movement has become undeniable, the left has shifted tactics. Remember I wrote this in September 2010. Now they're misrepresenting, defaming, and demonizing you. They're also instigating what they hope will be a civil war within the conservative ranks between tea partiers, notice I don't say tea baggers, <laughs> tea partiers and the Republican establishment in order to divide and conquer. Don't fall into this trap, I urged. Although many tea partiers are registered Republicans, the movement itself is independent and not synonymous with the Republican Party. Nonetheless, the agendas of the two groups are overwhelmingly consistent, the Tea Party and the GOP. And the GOP will necessarily, necessarily and essentially be the electoral victory for the achievement of Tea Party goals. As I'll expand upon later, there is no other practical existent vehicle than the Republican Party, with the emphasis on the word practical. The overriding imperative that trumps any differences among those on the right is to defeat Democrats and regain legislative majorities locally and nationally. Understandably, Tea Parties have been disappointed with Republican backsliding in recent years. 
I wrote this in 2010. Backsliding from the conservatism of Ronald Reagan. This has bred frustration and anger. Many traditional Republicans feel the same way. Electoral defeats in 2006 and 2008 had been a wake-up call to mainstream Republicans. That combined with Tea Party influence and the anti-Obama counter-revolution has produced a conservative resurgence within the Republican Party. Liberal Republicans like Arlen Specter from Pennsylvania, you remember him, have been driven out of the party or defeated by conservatives in some primary races. Yes, some soft Republicans remain, but not all state and congressional districts are receptive to conservatives. The best example I can give you of that is the state of Maine. Olympia Snow and Susan Collins, two United States Senators from the state of Maine. Olympia Snow is no longer in the Senate, Susan Collins still is. These two Senators were among the most liberal members of the United States Senate who were Republicans. Because they're from the state of Maine. And the state of Maine would not elect a conservative Republican. Period. Not going to happen. So, you settle for two wishy-washy Republicans. Because when you count noses, if you have 51 noses with an R on them, then Republicans are the majority party in the United States Senate, with two squishy Republican women for Maine. But as the majority party, the Republicans get to control every single committee and subcommittee. A Republican is chairman of every single committee and subcommittee. That's the way it works. Now, if you want to be purist about it, you challenge Snow and Collins in a primary. Within the Republican Party, you probably could get two conservative nominees to replace them in a primary before an election. Two conservative Republican nominees, both of whom would lose in the election. And now the Democrats have a majority in the U.S. Senate if those are the swing seats. That's the way it works. Recall that in 2006 and 2008, liberal Democrats were overjoyed to see their party's victorious, conservative, blue dog Democrats help them achieve a majority in Congress. A majority they couldn't have won if they had run liberals in those races. Blue dog, yellow dog, you know the term. Back in the, the solid south, someone would say, uh, I'd vote for a yellow dog before I voted for a Republican. <laughs> well, a blue dog Democrat is a more conservative Democrat. And the Democrats collectively, when they fashioned their strategy in 2006, trying to get control of the U.S. House, decided they needed to have some blue dog Democrats be the nominee in congressional districts where a liberal Democrat couldn't win. And it worked for them. By the way, a lot of those blue dog Democrats were tossed out in 2010. The entire House of Representatives, all 435 of them, are up for re-election every two years, and the Senate is every six years. By the way, one of the reasons that Republican prospects are so good for taking a, a Republican majority in 2014, the six-year cycle, 2014 goes back to 2008. And in 2008, the Democrats did very well in the United States Senate. So Democrats in swing states that won in 2008 are up for re-election in 2014. And the Democrats are defending twice as many seats as Republicans are in 2014. You know, one-third of the Senate is up every six years. So now the class of 2008 is up for re-election. The Tea Party movement isn't monolithic. It's made up of millions of different people united by various shades of conservative vision. It includes political veterans, tempered by experience, and newcomers overflowing with idealistic enthusiasm. There's no shortage of principle and passion among Tea Partners. But as I said in that open letter in 2010, I urge some in your ranks to holster your pitchforks. <laughs> Don't discard your principles or extinguish your passion, just channel it. America is at best, at best, a right-center nation. 
and maybe less so today of a right center nation than it was when Ronald Reagan was elected in 1980. It's certainly not an ultra-conservative nation. Radical leftists like MoveOn.org and the Daily Coast and Huffington Post, that crowd pushed the Democratic Party to extremes that have led to its downfall. Let's not make that mistake on the right. So let's talk about politics. And I'll start by making this observation. I regard myself as ideological. And that's not a pejorative term, not a negative when I use it. That combination of ideas and logic is what motivates me. It's my vision. It's the context in which I analyze policy. Ideology is about ideas. Politics is about winning elections about winning elections. I've had discussions with people where they'll say, well, you're, you're awfully practical, but all you want to do is win, win the next election. I want to save the country, somebody might say. Well, I want to save the country too. But I can't save the country in one fell swoop. And it's not clear, by the way, whether we can save the country. Somebody once said, democracy is destiny, and democracy is not moving in our direction. I'm not a defeatist. I'd be too stubborn to give up, even if I didn't think we had any chance. But let's face it, when you take a look at population trends in this country, and the influence of K-12 education, and higher education, and social media, and Hollywood, and television, uh, these aren't safe houses for us. doesn't mean we still can't win elections. Even when things were going bad over the last several years, in 2012, we wound up winning four of the seven U.S. House seats in Colorado, even while the Democrats had a majority in the state legislature, both houses and the governorship. So, in order to save the country down the road, you first have to win elections. This next election, and maybe the election after that, and maybe the election after that. I've seen the pendulum swing so many times in my lifetime that never is a long time in politics. Remember Watergate? But when when uh, the Democrats beat Jerry Ford, who succeeded Richard Nixon when Nixon retired or resigned in the 1976 election. Boy, it seemed it was, as if it was going to be a long, long time before a Republican was elected president again. And then came Jimmy Carter, and by 1980, Ronald Reagan won in a landslide. Things can change. You've heard uh, some old bromide, what if you threw a party and nobody came? I'm talking politics now. Well, here's a contemporary paraphrase of that old cliché. What if you threw a tea party and less than a plurality came? The answer is that some other party garnering more votes would wind up governing. This is a political dilemma for Republicans that Democrats hope to exploit. Whether some people like it or not, including about a third of voters who are registered independents, we have essentially a two-party system in this country. And that's not going to change any time soon. Once upon a time, we had a two-party system, the Whigs and the Democrats. The Whig Party faded away and was replaced by the Republican Party, as we know it today. Remember who the first Republican was elected president in the new Republican Party? Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln in 1860. No more Whigs. Something replaced the Republican Party. Excuse me, something replaced the Whig Party. But we still had a two-party system. A little later, I'll take you through a brief history of third-party candidates, even ones that were able to attract a lot of votes. So, we have a two-party system that's not going to change anytime soon. At the local and national level, you'll be governed by either Republicans or Democrats, and the coalitions that coalesce around each of these major parties. And when you've heard me ad nauseum on the air, 
explain my theory of why party trumps person, this is what it's all about. Coalitions. Each of our two major parties has an identifiable coalition. On the Democrat side, what makes up the Democrat coalition? Labor unions. First and foremost, that's where the big money comes from, the big organized money. To say nothing of the big money that comes from billionaires on the left who contribute to Democrats or who contribute to 527 groups with unlimited funding opportunities that don't endorse specific candidates but make very clear which, which candidates you should vote for. The teachers union is the largest and most powerful and influential union in the United States of America. It's not the AFL-CIO anymore. It's not the United Auto Workers. It's the teacher unions. The Democratic Party is a wholly owned subsidiary of the teacher unions. At the national level, at the state level. Remember one of the first things Barack Obama did when he took office? One of the very first things. He killed the Washington, D.C. voucher program. The program overwhelmingly that benefited poor minority kids whose parents through a voucher could get out of the terrible public school system and get their kids into the school of their choice. Why did Obama kill that? Because the teachers union insisted that that be killed. When Jimmy Carter was elected in 1976, there was a major government department called the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, HEW. Remember that? HEW sure. -E doesn't exist anymore. Why not? Because as a payoff to the teacher union, Jimmy Carter, with the acquiescence of Congress, created the Department of Education, which left the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare to go by the name Health and Human Services, HHS. He created a separate Department of Education. In addition to the teacher unions, you have government employees, the national level, the state level, at the local level. In Colorado, the state legislature, with the majority of Democrats in both houses. I wish I could remember off the top of my head exactly how many current or former teachers and other educators, including principals and administrators, are in the state legislature. But there's no shortage of them. And the chairman of the House Education Committee and the, the Senate Education Committee in Colorado are members in good standing of the teachers' union. And they vote accordingly. And they hate vouchers. And they don't like charters either. It's only grudgingly that we get money for charter schools. Oh, I just forgot. It's for the children. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, minority groups. At least those people within minority groups who identify with their minority groups. As you know, more than 90% of blacks vote for the Democratic candidate for president, election in and election out. Not quite as many Latinos vote for Democrats, but overwhelmingly Latinos vote for Democrats. Uh, this certainly drives policy regarding comprehensive immigration reform and terminology such as not illegal alien, but undocumented immigrant. If I have my driver's license revoked and I'm still driving, am I an undocumented driver? <laughs> Uh, women overwhelmingly vote for Democrats. However, there's a split there. Married women at the, at the margin vote for Republicans. Single women overwhelmingly vote for Democrats. Young people vote for Democrats. I can go on and on. You get the point. There's a huge coalition. Republicans have its co their coalition too, but Republicans are like, less collectivist than, than Democrats. So many Republicans are more individualistic. Republicans tend to be small business people. Uh, executives of big corporations tend to be pragmatic, not principled. And they tend to support the party in power, the party they think will be in power. There's so much crony capitalism now, regardless of which party is in power. I'd like to see so much less of that. But in any event, the coalition will be served by the majority party that wins control of a legislative body or Congress. In the executive branch, when there's a president or a governor, let's stay with the president for a second. 
the coalition will be served by a Republican of a party whose coalition won. So the President of the United States gets to a point about 3,000 what the government terms Schedule C employees. These are people who serve at the pleasure of the President. These are people who are secretaries, undersecretaries, deputies, assistants, who aren't part of the civil service. When Barack Obama is president, the National Labor Relations Board is stocked with union activists. The Federal Communications Commission, stocked with people who want to return to the Fairness Doctrine to kill talk radio if they could get away with it. President gets to nominate judges for all the federal courts and the U.S. Supreme Court. The coalition will be served. Sotomayor, uh, Kagan, thank you, Elizabeth Kagan, Sotomayor, wow, what a surprise. It's the way it works. That's why party trumps person. Just one example that I, that I give, where somebody, somebody wants to elevate his stature in your mind and he says, I'm an independent thinker, I vote for the person, not the party. This is somebody who, if he's sincere, is very naive about the way politics works. And here's the example. There are 435 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. You need 218 to have a majority. The Dem Democrats have a majority. Nancy Pelosi is Speaker of the House. She'd love to be Speaker of the House. Democrats are not going to win control of the House in 2014. There's no chance of it. But in any event, at the beginning of a session, there's a figurative counting of noses. And every nose in that room has a D or an R on it, with some exceptions. And Bernie Sanders, the socialist from Vermont, and by the way, he is a socialist. He caucuses with the Democrats, but he, he defines himself as a socialist. For all intents and purposes, he's a Democrat because he caucuses with the Democrat uh, majority in, in, uh, in the U.S. House. Let's say in your congressional district, there's a two-way race, and there's a really weak Republican, wishy-washy kind of a guy, He's not even likable, but he's a Republican. Running against the Democrat, who's a, a very bright go-getter, solid as can be on the issues, and moderately conservative. And you say, I'm a free thinker, I vote for the person, not the party, and you vote for Joe Smith, the Democrat. And when they do that nose count, it was 217 to 217, they got to Joe Smith, and there's a D on his nose, and Nancy Pelosi is Speaker of the House. That's the way it works. That's why you never, if you're a Republican, never vote for a Democrat. <laughs> Certainly in a legislative body. And if you're a Democrat, never vote for a Republican. It's just the way it works. We're a two-party system. In, in Europe, in Europe they have parliamentary systems. We don't have a parliamentary system. Ours is a unique system. In Europe, the head of government who is, in our country, the president. In Europe, it's the prime minister. The prime minister in Britain, Germany, and other places is elected by the legislative branch, by parliament. There's no separate election, such as there is in this country. In Europe, they have a lot of minor parties, and they have what's called uh, fractional voting, or in the parliamentary crisis, there's proportional representation. Meaning that the Green Party in Germany, radical left-wing environmental party, even if they don't win one seat in the German legislature, the Bundestag or the Bundesrat, even if they don't win one seat, if in the aggregate they get 5% of all the votes cast for parliament, they get representation that's reflective of their share of the overall vote. That doesn't happen in this country. All you need is a plurality. In every single congressional district, all 435 of them, in the election, whoever gets a plurality of the vote wins, even if it's not a majority. They have coalitions in Europe too, but they form their coalition after an election. Since they don't have two major parties that dominate, they do have major parties, but not necessarily either of which will have a majority, they have to gather around and each of the bigger parties tries to make a deal with the minor parties 
to come up with a majority of seats. That's their coalition. They form their coalition after an election. In our country, we form our coalitions before the election. But in both countries, there's always a coalition. There's a, a fellow trying to get on the Colorado ballot by petition. Three measures, I won't go into the details. His name is Ryan Ross. I'm trying to get him booked on my radio show. He wants to transform the way we vote in Colorado. One of the things he wants to do is do away with the way we nominate people. They do this in, in some other states as well. It's a growing movement where you get three votes. You pick your first choice, second choice, and third choice. And then if the first choices don't produce a majority, you strike off the person that got the least first place votes, and then you use that person's second choice to see if you can come up with a majority. And you keep doing this, eliminating the person at the end of the list until you come up with a majority. As a consequence, you can have an election where on the final ballot there's no Republican at all. Uh, you get three bites at the apple. It's a terrible system. Minor parties love it because it gives them a chance of winning elections where they couldn't possibly win them in the, in the, uh, in the past. Uh, I'm going to write some columns about this when we get closer to the election. It's a terrible idea. And it imagines that it's going to do away with partisanship and party politics. It isn't. Those coalitions I talked about will still be there. And they'll still pick the candidates they want and pour money into the campaign. All right, that was a digression. I hadn't planned that talk. It's a bonus. <laughs> so, when I, when I talk about either Republicans or Democrats and the coalitions around them that are going to govern, obviously, it's no surprise that I say I'm a partisan Republican, and I am because I support that party's agenda and coalition. And I'm a conservative because I favor limited government, private enterprise, individual liberty, along with a number of other values that distinguish me from liberals and Democrats. But I can tick off 20 of those values that put me completely in agreement with just about everybody in the Tea Party movement. The dif differences we have are just as a matter of degree and as a matter of strategy. After the failure of Republicans to defund Obamacare or win substantive concessions from majority Democrats in the Senate during that partial government shutdown, I've heard some disgruntled Tea Partiers frustrated with the philosophical imperfection of the Republican Party declare that they will overthrow its national establishment and reform the party in its own image, in the Tea Party image. You've probably heard some of this. Failing that, they threatened to form their own party. Either path would be political suicide and guarantee a progressive Democrat lock on power. As I said, philosophically, I share most of the Tea Party agenda. I applaud its passion. It's a vital part of the Republican coalition. But it's only part of that coalition. It's not a majority of it, and it's certainly well below a majority of the American people. Only about a third of Americans regard themselves as Republicans. So Republicans are a fraction of the American body politic. And the Tea Party is a fraction of the Republican Party. So the Tea Party is a fraction of a fraction. The notion that the Tea Party could be a majority party on its own is delusional. I wish that weren't the case, but that's the reality. It's why libertarians as a party, you know, they're lowercase libertarians and uppercase libertarians. Lowercase libertarians are people who philosophically are libertarian. Now, there's a lot of libertarian in you. A lot, of, but not 100%. I'd never trust a libertarian to be commander-in-chief, for example. The libertarian vision of foreign policy and, and the role of the United States military is wholly unrealistic in my judgment. And I think in the judgment of a majority of Americans. What's more, in presidential elections, over the last 50 years, the Libertarian nominee for president has gotten, on average, one half of 1% of the popular vote. Now, you might say if Libertarians had more exposure, they could do better. Probably could. They could get 2%. Maybe 3, maybe 4, maybe 5. But I'm sorry to say that the vast majority of Americans in our ever-evolving welfare state, which is much more evolved as a welfare state than I'd like to see it, 
the vast majority of Americans don't have the self-confidence and the rigor and the self-reliance to adopt a dogmatic libertarian agenda. They just want too much help from too much government in too many places about too many things, and that's a reality. And it's not a reality that will ever change. So, I wish more Americans embraced the fundamental values of our nation's founders and their vision of political economy than is currently the case, but they don't. If they did, Barack Obama wouldn't have been elected and re-elected. Tea Partiers, many of them, and they're not monolithic, I'll get to that point in just a second. Many Tea Partiers imagine that their movement has a greater following than sadly it actually does. And let me give you some numbers to back that up. We got a Gallup poll here from January 2014. Ideological self-identification. Here's the question. How would you describe your political views? Very conservative, conservative, moderate, liberal, or very liberal? And now we combine some of the categories. Conservative, 38%. That's a plurality. More people define themselves as conservative than any other possibility. It's good. Moderate, 34%. Liberal, 23%. Boy, a much greater percentage of conservatives than liberals. Mm, don't get gulled by that. Because so many of the moderates are really liberals who call themselves moderates. Conservatives are proud of what they believe in. If a pollster asks them, what are you? I am a conservative. A lot of liberals will say, well, I'm moderate. Everybody wants to co-opt the middle. They want to be regarded as centrists. Well, because they call themselves moderate, it doesn't mean they're moderate in the people they vote for and their vision of what the role of government is. As a matter of fact, when Gallup began asking about ideological identification, in 1992, an average of 17% of Americans said they were liberal. That dipped to 16% in 1996, but has gradually increased, exceeding 20% each year since. The rise in liberal identification, I'm reading right from this Gallup survey, the rise in liberal identification has been accompanied by a decline in moderate identification. There you go. That's where it shifted, from moderate to liberal. Because their team is winning now, because Obama won, they feel better about calling themselves a liberal. <laughs> Washington Post. Sean Sullivan wrote a, piece, uh, wrote a piece in March of this year. Is Tea Party candidate a toxic label or a badge of honor? Well, it depends on who you ask. Therein lies the conundrum for the Republican Party. By nearly two to one, Republicans say a candidate's Tea Party affiliation makes it more likely they will vote for them. But, by about the same margin, the broader pool of Americans is less likely to vote for that candidate. And here's the breakdown. Among Republicans, 30% say if a candidate for Congress supports the Tea Party political movement, would that make you more likely to vote for that candidate, less likely, or wouldn't it make a difference? Among Republicans, 30% say it would make them more likely to vote for that candidate, 18% less likely, 50% no difference. Among independents, 15% said they'd be more likely to vote for a Tea Party candidate. 34% said they'd be less likely to vote for a Tea Party candidate. Mm -hmm. You can't win without independence. Here's what the Washington Post concludes. And the Washington Post is not rooting for Republicans, keep in mind. In short, it's generally a good idea for Republican candidates to embrace the Tea Party in a primary but in swing districts and states, it's typically a bad one to do it, or at least to do it too much in the general election. You can win in a lot of districts by being to the Tea Party right of some more moderately conservative Republicans. But if it's a swing district, you're likely to lose the general election. So when I, when I threw out the notion that frustrated members of the Tea Party movement might break off and form their own party, 
think the consequence of that would be to permanently condemn the Tea Party to minor party status. That's the, the fate of the Green Party, Libertarians, Ross Perot's Reform Party. Remember what happened to that? When Ross Perot ran in 1992, denying George H.W. Bush re-election, he got 20 million votes. About 20% of all the votes cast for president. Wow, 20 million votes. Do you know how many electoral college votes he got? Zero. We don't have a national election for president. No such thing. We have independent elections in each of the 50 states and the District of Columbia. All separate elections. And you need a plurality of the vote in every one of those elections to get an electoral college vote. And Ross Perot did not win one state. So we got zero electoral college votes. The Reform Party hung around for another four years or so and then kind of faded away, it didn't replace the Republican Party, it didn't even survive as a, as a third party. A little history for you. I mentioned that Lincoln was the first Republican elected in 1960. It was the Whig Party that faded away. In 1968, Richard Nixon got 31.8 million votes. Hubert Humphrey got 31.3 million votes. Governor George Wallace, running as an independent third party candidate, got 9.9 .9 million votes. So combined, Humphrey and Wallace got 41.2 million, Nixon got 31.8 million. And George Wallace actually got some electoral college votes because he carried some, some uh, southern states. But Nixon won. George Wallace only denied the presidency to Hubert Humphrey by running. 1912. Woodrow Wilson got 6.3 million votes. Teddy Roosevelt got 4.1 million votes. In 1912, Teddy Roosevelt, having been president earlier, deserted the Republican Party and formed what was known as the Bull Moose Party. It was actually technically the Progressive Party. And, and Teddy actually moved to his left. He championed an estate tax, income taxes, things like that. In any event, he ran, got 4.1 million votes, Taft got 3.5 million votes, that was 7.6 million. Together more than Woodrow Wilson got, Woodrow Wilson won the election handily. I mentioned Ross Pro in 1992 and 2000. Al Gore ran against George W. Bush. It was a very, very close election, you'll remember. Ralph Nader ran as the Green Party candidate in that year. He got 2% of the national vote. He got 5% of the popular vote in the state of Florida. That enabled George W. Bush to win in Florida. He became president of the United States. If Ralph Nader hadn't been in the race, those Green Party votes obviously would have gone to, to Gore more than George W. Bush. That's the influence of third parties in this country. They're spoilers. They don't win elections. Getting back to the all-powerful National Republican Establishment. Uh, this is a term that was popular years ago. I'm sorry to say that I hear Rush Limbaugh use it all the time. It's dated. There is no Republican establishment. There's no such thing. There are 50 different Republican parties among the states, each with its own demographics, culture, coalition, and power centers. There is no monolithic, aggregate, national Republican establishment, Republican establishment that has much influence. In each of those states, some, some of them have Republicans in power and governing. Others are in states where they never will govern. Think of New York and California. The control and influence of the national Republican leadership is extremely limited. The Rockefeller wing of the Republican Party, that's what historically people meant when they talked about the Republican establishment. When I supported Barry Goldwater in 1964, and I was only 20, so I wasn't eligible to vote yet, the voting age was 21, uh, there was a Republican establishment. Uh, they're gone. Republicans like Lowell Weicker from Connecticut, and Jacob Javits from New York, and uh, uh, Richard Schweiker from Pennsylvania, Mark Hatfield from Oregon, 
Uh, Margaret Chase Smith from Maine, who preceded Collins and Olympia Snow, incidentally, they're gone. They're not around anymore. After the setbacks that Republicans had in 2006 and 2008, the Republican Party moved to the right. Not to the radical right, but it moved markedly to the right. Thanks to the help of the Tea Party in 2010. It's a major contribution. Tea Partiers are understandably angry with our country's direction under the leftist progressivism of Democrats and a president who wants to fundamentally transform America into something our founders wouldn't recognize. I understand the frustration and the anger of many in the Tea Party movement. But anger, frustration, and sincerity aren't sufficient to forge a winning political strategy. I'm angry and frustrated too, but I'm, I'm constrained by political reality. Denying the present reality won't change it, but it can lead one to hubris and self-destructive strategies. In Obama's second term, this, this implosion of feckless Democrat policies from the economy to foreign affairs to Benghazi to the IRS scandal, it has created new realities and opportunities for the Republican coalition, assuming the Republican coalition stays together. And it's able to attract enough swing voters to forge an electoral majority. If the Tea Party wants to be part of a governing coalition, it needs to be a member of that imperfect team. I hear people on both sides of the political aisle invoke those words, we the people, we the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect team. Wait a second, we the people. How can Nancy Pelosi talk about we the people and at the same time have Ted Cruz talk about we the people? Obviously neither one of them is talking about all the people. So who are the people they're talking about? America is sharply divided. <clears throat> Some of the people who want to impose uh, further restrictions on campaign finance reform, who want to do with partisanship, who want to de-emphasize political parties, they think that money and partisanship is the reason for the great national divide. They're putting the, the cart before the horse. <clears throat> the money and the partisanship, that's the consequence of the national divide. We have this huge national divide because the welfare state has hit the wall. It's hit the wall of reality. We can't afford it anymore. At 24% of gross domestic product, that's federal spending as a share of the economy. That's beyond our tax capacity, which is about 19%, maybe 18% of GDP. You can't raise taxes enough to get to 24% of GDP. <clears throat> Nonetheless, the left doesn't want to give away with the ever-growing welfare state. And the right is committed to constitutionalism and limited government. Barack Obama now is in the process of undermining our military strength. The kinds of cuts they're making in defense spending are outrageous. Ronald Reagan was moving toward a 600-ship Navy. We've got 240 ships in the Navy right now, and Obama wants to bring it down. We've got aircraft that are older than the people who fly them, begging for parts. Uh, we haven't begun to restore the material that was exhausted in Iraq and Afghanistan. This is a divide. Foreign policy is a divide. The future of education is a huge divide. This is the reality of the American public. And no amount of tinkering with the system is going to change that. I want to read a couple of things. A couple of examples of excessive, destructive Tea Party exuberance. And I'm not talking about I'm not talking about everybody in the Tea Party group. See this is an <laughs> And we repeal the law of gravity. I've heard some Democrats who want to make it easier for kids in school, want to make math easier, and they've advanced a measure in Congress that hasn't been passed yet. Remember when you took uh, geometry and trigonometry? Remember what pi was? Who can rattle off pi? 3.14125. They went around pi to 3.0 just to make it. Any of it. A Tea 
Party Group. It's called the Tea Party Leadership Fund. Has launched a campaign to support primary challenges against all 87 Republicans who voted for that deal last October about ending the government shutdown. Remember, we were hoping to hold Obama and the Democrats hostage. We wanted, them to, we wanted Obama to give up Obamacare, as if this was remotely possible. And they were going to resist passing a continuing resolution or raising the debt limit in order to force Obama to give up Obamacare and do a bunch of other things that couldn't possibly happen. It was a terrible strategy. Couldn't possibly have worked. But they pushed it nonetheless. Finally, when it was apparent that this was a big loser for Republicans, all you had to do was look at the polls. A compromise was reached, and 87 Republicans in the House voted with the Democrats to, to move on. The Tea Party Leadership Fund has dubbed those 87 Republicans traitors. That's the word they use, traitors. And they pledged to fight all of them in Republican primaries. Somebody got a flashlight? Seriously. Oh, see, there's no lights over here. And this is infinitesimal. <laughs> or somebody can hold a match. Hold a phone. Light one of the candles and curse the darkness. Oh, okay. Uh, 87 Republican traitors. This is a Tea Party group that sent this out as a fundraising appeal. Look at Mike Coffin, United States Marine, two tours in Iraq, wonderful guy, very conservative voting record, had a safe seat in the U.S. House before reapportionment. The 6th Congressional District was solidly Republican. Uh, now it's a swing district favoring Democrats. Andrew Romanoff is going to be his opponent. It's going to be a very tough fight for Mike. It's a shame. He's a good friend of mine and I love him. The trade-off was Cory Gardner in the 4th District had a, a seat now as safe as, as Mike Coffman's was back in the day. But Corey's going to run for senator, taking on Mark Udall. And by the way, that's a that's a courageous move on Corey Gardner. He'd have that seat in the fourth for as long as he wants it. Uh, now he's in a tight race with Udall, but it's a winnable race. Uh, Mike Coffman is on this list as a traitor. Scott Tipton from the West Slope is on this list as a traitor. Corey Gardner is on this list as a traitor. Daryl Issa from California, a rock-solid Republican, is a traitor. Eric Cantor, of the up-and-coming bright young Republicans. I won't read all 87 names. This is idiotic. These people aren't traitors. They simply recognize the reality of a failed strategy and stop digging a deeper hole. It's not about ideology or philosophy. This was about political strategy. And from the very beginning, I said it was a bad strategy. Now, I'm a budget one. You've probably heard me talk about that on the air when I worked at the Pentagon. I was in the bowels of the federal budget process. I understand continuing resolutions. I understand all the rules, all the, all the backroom stuff. I know what can work and what can't. From the very beginning, this Republican strategy to hold Obama's feet to the fire couldn't possibly work. And this guy is intransigent. He's the worst president ever. He doesn't know how to govern. He doesn't compromise. Reagan had to compromise all the time. Reagan knew he wasn't elected king. And by the way, Ronald Reagan had a, a Democrat majority in the U.S. House for his entire eight years. He had to work with him, and he did. But he got a lot of things he wanted in, especially those across the board tax rate cuts, taking the top margin rate down 28%, and everybody else's margin rate along with it. Anyway, that's an example of, of Tea Party excess. But this one fringe Tea Party group doesn't speak to the entire movement. When Ed Sutton asked me if I'd come speak, I asked him, what kind of Tea Party group uh, do you have? And he said, no, 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 you like this party. <laughs> they're not all the same, but they're not, they're not crazy radicals. They're realists. Uh, this is from uh, Publius Productions. I'm on their email list. I get an email from them every single day, and they're promoting uh, the Tea Party people, some of whom I've had on the air. Here's the latest communique. Listen to this. The relationship, or lack thereof, between the mainstream of the Republican Party and the Tea Party has long been poo-pooed by Republican strategists as standard operating procedure for a party out of the White House. The base and the establishment feud 
But in the end, the base falls in line. But what if the Tea Party movement represents something new and less manageable for the establishment heading into the 2016 presidential race? I told you that the establishment is a term that to be used nonetheless. While parties typically have a hard core, somewhat disaffected minority, they are usually swept along with the current of a larger movement. However, in the case of the Tea Party, their lack of central organization and strict adherence to ideology over politics makes them a potent ingredient tossed into the evolutionary soup. <clears throat> that the establishment wing of the party is neither unwilling or unable to co-opt them for the larger goal of winning major elections shows just how exotic an addition to the mix the Tea Party is. They won't do what you want them to unless they've already made up their mind to do it. Reasoning with them doesn't work because their starting point isn't based in rationality, but passion. Now this is from somebody who's a big fan of the Tea Party. Their starting point isn't based in rationality, but passion. Passion is a highly overrated virtue when it comes to politics. It can't trump reality. Keeping coalitions together. Can you think of some really tough coalitions? that were difficult to keep together historically, not just political coalitions in the, in the capital D politics sense. One came to my mind. Think of the se Second World War. Think of the Supreme Allied Commander, Supreme Headquarters, Allied Expeditionary Force here of Chase. That was General Eisenhower. Think of the coalition you had to keep together. The Brits with Montgomery. <laughs> The Free French with Charles de Gaulle, talking about egos. The Russians with Stalin. The Russians. Patton, Bradley, among his own generals. How about his admirals? He had to keep together Nimitz and Halsey, and he had Hap Arnold running the Army Air Corps. Uh, General Marshall. Uh, MacArthur in the Pacific. He had Aussies and Kiwis who don't like each other. Filipinos who wanted MacArthur to come back next Tuesday. <laughs> He had Brits. Uh, he kept this coalition together because their unifying purpose trumped all the, all the minor disagreements that they had. Remember who said, I'd rather be right than be president? Henry Clay said that. A great orator from Kentucky, wasn't he? Wonderful orator. Highly principled man. Henry Clay ran for president four different times. What number president was Henry Clay, do you remember? No, oh, he wasn't president. He'd rather be right than be president. Well, he was never president. A majority of voters have to perceive that you're right if you're going to get elected, even if you're right, even if you're objectively right. But suppose you're wrong, and he's right in his vision. But a lot of people who have many things in common don't agree about everything. And any party that aspires to be a majority party, and that's what it's all about, you've got to have more seats in the legislature than the other party. If you want to be a majority party, you have to have a big enough tent to have people who disagree about some things. Here's a bit of advice. This is a Jake Cost in the Weekly Standard, a really good column recently. You remember William F. Buckley's uh, admonition. <coughs> Nominate the most electable conservative. And Sutton referred to that without mentioning Buckley by name earlier. Lacking institutional mechanisms to force consensus, Republicans themselves will have to choose it given the reality about the establishment and the grassroots cannot thrive without each other. As they mold the alternatives, all participants in the nominating process must ask themselves three questions. Here they are. Number one, this is the candidate who will be your nominee. Number one, can this candidate win the support of the unaffiliated voters who decide general elections? Number two, is the establishment of the party comfortable enough with this nominee to put forth all the money it can? <coughs> Number three, are the grassroots excited enough about this nominee to show up in November? The candidates for whom all three answers are yes are the fusion candidates who belong at the top of any Republican's list. 
Most of the successful Republican nominees from Lincoln to the second Bush were such candidates, able to bridge the socio-economic and ideological divides within their party. Such candidates unite the party by emphasizing the issues that excite both sides, ignoring those that are divisive, projecting a disposition that makes everybody feel welcome, and highlighting a personal background with which all factions can identify. For some, this will feel like a letdown. It's more emotionally satisfying to channel Theodore Roosevelt prior to the Republican Convention in 1912. Maybe I, remember I made reference to that? Who declaimed at the time, we stand at Armageddon and we battle for the Lord. That's what Roosevelt said when he helped inadvertently Woodrow Wilson win the election. But Roosevelt's breakaway Bulbo's party was short-lived. The Democrat Woodrow Wilson won in 1912, and Teddy Roosevelt was back in the Republican fold by 2000, by 1916. That's how it usually goes. Disagreements within a coalition are rarely resolved, only papered over, usually by the personal charm and political skill of the nominee. One last item. <coughs> Two last items. And it's ten after eight, so I'm going to be done in about ten minutes. So, I'll have plenty of time for questions and comments after that. I've given talks before, after a few hours, people start shaking their watches. <laughs> Two things. Matt Welch is the editor in chief of Reason Magazine, which is a libertarian publication I'm a subscriber. I'm a full blown libertarian, but I've always been inspired by a lot of the libertarian ideas. He did a piece on Rand Paul. Now, Kentucky is an interesting state. Mitch McConnell is the Senate majority, minority leader. Rand Paul is a libertarian son of Ron Paul, who's also a United States senator from Kentucky. Uh, there's a movement afoot by some Tea Partiers in Kentucky that are challenging Mitch McConnell in a primary. They will lose. And the guy they picked is terrible. Terrible. With all kinds of unvetted excess baggage. You remember Sharon Angle in Nevada? Mm -hmm. Tea Party. They got her on the ballot against Harry Reid. Harry Reid would have lost that election. He'd be ancient it. He'd be gone. Sharon Angle, terrible. Christine O'Donnell in Delaware, terrible. Uh, then you had some, some social issues conservative Republicans in the last election who not only put their foot in their mouths, they put that leg in up to their, their, their hip. Uh, you had, uh, uh, let's see, it was um, Todd Aiken in Missouri who said uh, if a woman's raped, she can't get pregnant because the, the, the conceptual process uh, well, isn't, isn't uh, vulnerable to a, a forced... Uh... And then Todd Aiken, who said if a woman's raped and uh, becomes pregnant, it was, it, God intended it that way. I think I know what he was trying to say, but he wasn't saying God intended that she be raped. But when he phrased it, that's what, what sunk him. It's a legitimate rape. Yeah, a legitimate rape. <laughs> like this. That was a winning race. So, uh, Matt Welch, a libertarian, is writing this in, in Reason Magazine about Rand Paul. And what triggers it is some libertarians thought that Rand Paul was getting too soft. Because to get elected in Kentucky, and now that he's an aspiring nominee for the Republican presidential uh, nomination, uh, he's also softened some of his positions on defense, for example, and foreign policy. So some libertarians are turning on Rand Paul, who is, by any measure, the most libertarian member of the United States Congress, with Ron Paul being gone. But this is fascinating, and it applies to the Tea Party and other, other movements. This is what Matt Welch has to say. Rand Paul's practical definition of libertarianism, or constitutional conservatism, if you prefer, will certainly differ from mine. So Matt Welsh is saying that he's more pure libertarian than Rand Paul, but that's okay with me. He's very strongly anti-abortion. One of his first acts in the Senate was to co-sponsor the Life Begins at Conception Act. And while I have 
intellectual respect for the libertarian anti-abortion argument, I don't agree with it, says Manuel. He does not favor gay marriage, as with abortion he prefers such things to be handled at the state level. So this has earned him the criticism of some libertarians who think anything goes. He, meaning Rand Paul, talks about wanting to secure the border in ways that I instinctively recoil from. Purist libertarians believe in open borders. Matt Welch does. Rand Paul doesn't. <coughs> if you were to say that, he'd have no chance of getting the Republican nomination. You recognize that. Why? He doesn't even want to legalize heroin. Rand Paul says Matt Welch. <laughs> there is no limited government faction small enough that it doesn't want to split itself in two with angry recriminations. Think of some fringe party with 12 people in it. What Welch is observing, and eventually six of them will be very mad at the other six because they disagree about something. Some of this reflects perfectly natural differences in philosophy within a marginal though growing political tendency that's anchored to explicitly philosophical roots. It's normal to compete over the term, over beliefs, over the market share of global libertarianism, or whatever, or whatever you want to call it, but let's be honest. This schismatic tendency stems partly from the instinctive crackiness, that's crankiness, from the instinctive crankiness of people who prefer living in the margins, nursing grievances, and hunting down heretics. They've chosen one lodestar, and anyone else casting off light in the darkness runs the risk of being treated like a hostile invader. It's puzzling, a puzzling conception of libertarianism that excludes the first senator in memory to be as anti-war, anti-surveillance, anti-police abuse, anti-big government, and anti-spending as Rand Paul. But nonetheless, he's earned the disfavoring criticism of some libertarians who don't really care about governing. All they want to do is indulge their uncompromising purity because it's a sport. I want to win elections. In some of those 435 congressional districts, you can run with a rock-solid Tea Party candidate who can win. Colorado Springs, for example. In other districts, you can't. Cory Gardner, now that he's running for statewide office, has changed some of his positions. You might remember when the 4th congressional district was his home and when he won easily, he was able to endorse the so-called personhood amendment. He has abandoned that. Uh, Laura Wood, running in Senate District 19, is a, a personhood fanatic. Senate 19 in Colorado is a seat that Evie Hudak <coughs> held. Evie Hudak gave up that seat at the 11th hour rather than face a recall because she knew if she went through the recall process, like her Roman Morse did, it would cost the Democrats that seat, giving the Republicans a majority in the Colorado State Senate. So she stepped aside, taking one for the team. When Evie Ludak was elected in Senate 19 the last time around, she won by 564 votes out of 75,000 votes to, to uh, uh, Sias Lang. Lang Sias, thank you. Lang Sias. She won by 564 votes because the Libertarian got 5,100 votes, costing the Republicans that seat. In this next election, some Libertarian is going to run again without a chance in the world of winning, taking seats away from Lang Sias. Now, Laura Woods is challenging Lang Sias in a primary. If the personhood amendment were to pass, which it can't. It lost 70 to 30 in Colorado last time around. It would make IUDs illegal and make some birth control pills illegal. Colorado is not Utah. Dogmatic anti-abortionism <coughs> in Colorado is a political loser. Some kind of a, a mis mainstream, a little of this, a little of that, anti-abortion position can win in Colorado, you can't be dogmatic about it in a statewide race. You might be dogmatic about it in a district race, but you can't do it statewide. When Bill Owens, the national governor, beat Gail Shepard, Owens is 
religious, he's a Christian, he's anti-abortion, he's a good friend of mine. But Bill softened his position because he was running in a statewide election. The only choice was between Republican Bill Owens and Democrat Gail Sheffield, a liberal feminist who is strongly pro-abortion. This name came up earlier. Uh, though I know, named, he ran as a third party candidate in that governor's race. He's a graduate of Hillsdale College. Tim Leonard. Good guy. Very religious. He ran as a third party candidate. Bill Owens won that election. Narrow. Uh, he won by fewer votes than this third party Tim Leonard candidate got. Had Tim Leonard gotten more votes, his reward would have been not having a governor who's anti-abortion, but having a governor who's pro-abortion. That's what spoiling candidates can do. Given the choice between Owens and Sheffler, is there any doubt who Tim Leonard would want to be governor? The other choice, him as governor, isn't on the menu of what was doable, what was possible. So you have to be selective in congressional districts. You size up a district and then you determine who can win. Cory Gardner has changed his position on personhood, saying he was mistaken adopting that earlier. Why? Partly because perhaps he's re-educated himself. Partly because he knows he's running in a statewide race, and that's a loser in a statewide race. So you don't be a martyr to a position that worked in a district, but won't work in a statewide, statewide race. All right, one final point, I promise. I've heard uh, some on the right, even some libertarians, say they don't mind being a spoiler, uh, they don't mind having Republicans lose elections. As a matter of fact, what they want is for Democrats to have a stronger majority in the state legislature, in the U.S. House, in the U.S. Senate, a Democrat president, another one after Barack Obama who will move the country even farther left, move it all the way to Eurosocialism and beyond. This is their strategy. Why? Because they believe that if the country collapses, if we go bankrupt, what will naturally follow is a drastic move to the right. And then we can have a purist libertarian for a purist republic. Ironically, there's something called the Cloward Piven strategy. Cloward and Piven are two radical left wing academics. And they believe the economy should collapse as well. Because if it does, the country will move sharply left. If I had to guess, sharply left would be the direction we'd move in. And I present the Great Depression as an example. When everything collapsed, when people felt insecure, they went with the New Deal and they moved sharply left. Insecurity will trump rationality, especially in a country where so few people understand what capitalism is. Especially in a country with so much populism that so many people are against banks and corporations and you name it, and against rich people. There is nothing that would sharply move this country in a right-wing direction in my view. I don't know what the future holds. Uh, I'm going to stick it out and keep doing what I do. Uh, in Colorado, we can, we've already moved this state marginally more to the right than where it was a few years ago, and I think we have a good chance of doing well in the next election. I think the Democrats are on the defensive and decline right now. Obama's a terrible president. A lot of swing voters see that, and the polls show it. We have to be practical and strategic, however, when we look at individual races, both in the state and all over the country, ideology is about ideas, politics is about winning elections. First, you've got to win the election. Okay, questions? <laughs> Uh, you've got uh, the oil industry that's part of the Republican coalition. Uh, you've got
got a lot, a lot of people who don't want to be grouped, uh, don't want to be practicing the politics of victimology, which is so popular in this country today. I mean, victimology has taken over college campuses in the United States. You, you heard about Condi Rice being disinvited at Rutgers University, a former Secretary of State, uh, the first black woman Secretary of State, the first woman Secretary of State. Condi Rice is no radical. It's insane. Uh, the uh, Ali Hersey, the, the Muslim who's had the courage to stand up to uh, Sharia jihadists, was also uh, disinvited to Brandeis, and they, they took away the honorary degree they were going to give her. Uh, you asked me about who's in the Republican coalition. Uh, it's, it's, to the extent that, that we are a nation that treasures individual liberty rather than collective liberty, uh, the notion that every individual should be should be uh, dominated by some majority. It's such a fundamental violation of what the founders wanted from the outset. The First Amendment is all about individual liberty, individual rights, protecting individuals from, from government. So part of the problem with our coalition is it's not organized the way the Democrat coalition is organized. The Democrat coalition is, is so much uh, a collection of various rent seekers, as it's called, that wants this, that, or something else from government. Now, that's why it's such a tough uphill climb. Now, nonetheless, we've been able to win some elections both locally and nationally. And uh, the influence you have over your kids is essential to offset the, the programming that your kids are going to get in K through 12 education and higher education and from television and the movies and from social media. And both of my daughters graduated from the University of Colorado. But they're both conservatives. So I take some credit for that. Now I had to force feed them a lot of stuff. <laughs> starting when they were two and three years old. But ever since they've been on their own, they, they, haven't, uh, they haven't deserved the cause. So, yeah. The diffuse interest for the uh, concentrated. Republicans versus the concentrated coalition of the Democrats. The Democrats have no shame when they had the, the, the presidency in both houses. They pushed through bills they had for had as we Would the Republicans do such things if they got all three, uh, if they had power like that? Would they be smart enough to push through things that need to be done, eliminating public service unions? Uh, uh, eliminating the capital gains taxes, things of that sort. Media began. Yeah, did everybody hear the question? When you hear somebody say that the members of Congress uh, voted for a bill they hadn't read, well, they always vote for bills that they hadn't read on both sides of the aisle. That's what they have staffers for. Nothing wrong with that. Their staffers specialize in this kind of stuff while the members of Congress are out trying to raise money for the next election, especially in the U.S. House. Now, some members of Congress are, are much better policy wants than others. Now, Paul Ryan, one of my favorites, is a legitimate policy one. And Ryan's the kind of guy that won't just rely on a staffer. Uh, he'll, he'll read a bill or at least enough of it to get a good sense of it. Some of the members of Congress won't even understand a bill when one of the staffers who specialize tries to brief that member of Congress on it. When I, when I worked at the when I worked at, uh, at the Pentagon for the Navy Department, having been in the Army in uniform and now I'm a senior civilian, I was the civilian equivalent of a rear admiral as compared to an Army E3 and E4, E5. I cited on dozens of committee hearings. What an educational process that was. Now, I can't generalize because members of Congress, both in the House and the Senate, come in different flavors. But the skills necessary to get elected are not necessarily anything like the skills necessary to be a wise governor. I don't mean governor, anybody, a legislator. Uh, I don't know what the percentage is. I would say that, in my judgment, 30% uh, of the members of Congress that I were exposed to, especially in the House, were dummies. Just lightweights. 
don't know, ward healers, whatever you want to call it. I remember I was at one, Ted Kennedy was uh, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee at the time, Republican, Democrats had a majority. And uh, I was sitting in, in the Judiciary Committee room. He was presiding, and the way it works, the, the, the senior member of the chairman is the one that asks the first question of the testifying witness, and everybody in turn gets to ask other questions. And in Kennedy's case, and in most other cases, one of his staffers prepared him with some questions. And he had three or four obviously prepared questions until he was reading. After the prepared questions, he was on his own. The contrast would have knocked you off your seat. <laughs> Whatever Ted Kennedy was, he was not a bright man. Certainly not like the brother Bobby or, or John F. Kennedy. Uh, anyway, that, that's not an exception in, in Congress. Uh, there are just too many like it. Uh, so, it's a diversion, but... Uh, so much of the game will still be played the way it's played, but there's only so much Republicans could do even if they had a majority. If they didn't have a filibuster-proof majority in the Senate, uh, they couldn't repeal even Obamacare. You know, Obamacare is, was legislated as the equivalent of an entitlement. It doesn't need a new appropriation every year. It's not automatic pilot. So you couldn't do away with Obamacare with a simple majority. Uh, also, even if Republicans could get uh, a majority in the Senate, as long as Obama's president, they'd need a two-thirds majority to override his veto. You could be sure he would veto any repeal of Obamacare. Reagan was able to get a lot of Democrats to join him in passing the tax reform policies after the 1980 election, because he was perceived to have a mandate, and because he was able to, to work with uh, work across the aisle much better than, than Obama has any interest in, in doing. So even if Republicans get a, a majority in both houses, uh, there's only so much they can do. They can certainly prevent anything new from being legislated that would cause more damage. Uh, where, where Obamacare goes is anybody's guess, and my notion of the long-term goal of Obamacare uh, was always to ultimately be a step along the way to socialized medicine, what they euphemistically call a single-payer system. And ironically, uh, the clumsier Obamacare is, and the more hardship it created on people who had to make all kinds of decisions, the more likely the outcome would be that uh, rather than throw the whole thing away, people would throw up their hands and say, hey, let's go all the way to socialized medicine. The Brits love it, the Canadians love it. That's not necessarily true, but that's what you heard. Uh, let's go there as well. And you remember during the Obamacare debate, uh, debate before it passed, you had people actually stepping forward and saying publicly, Democrats, that they wanted to get rid of the private health insurance industry. Now, almost all the Democrats believed that. Most of them were shrewd enough not to say it while Obamacare was being debated. The next step along the way, if Obamacare moves, moves to the level where Democrats want to take it, and I hope it doesn't because of our success in 14 and 16, the next step along the way, now that they've mandated that insurance companies have to provide coverages that people don't want that cost more money, and you hear people squealing about having to pay more money, the next step along the way is the equivalent of price controls on insurance companies. You force them to pay out more in benefits than their revenues, and then they go out of business. So, uh, it's not as if Republicans, if they do well in the next two elections, can flip a switch. It would take a long time to start to roll back the trajectory. And in order for that to happen, you'd have to find an American electorate that is willing to move away from this cradle-to-grave promise of security that Democrats are offering. Democrats can always outbid Republicans in an auction for desirable outcomes delivered by government. They can outbid them when it comes to the promises. They can't necessarily deliver, especially when we're spending beyond our tax capacity. But they can sure offer the promise of joy at somebody else's expense. It's what they do very, very well. I have a question. The VA, do you see the correlation of where Obamacare is going and how the lists and just the mess that is the, the VA? VA hospitals, no. I mean, do you do you see that? Sure. And and if you do, why why isn't it being in the the right leaning press being? Kind of said, this is where we're going, well, kids. Well, the right-leaning press is doing exactly that. I've said almost what you just said on the air. Limbaugh said it, and a bunch of others have. Weekly Standard has said it. 
here's the analogy I made. 85% of Americans had health insurance of one form or another before we started this whole Obamacare debate. When you hear those statistics about the percentage of Americans who are uninsured, they were grossly exaggerated because they counted people as uninsured who were uninsured even if for only one day in a given year, when the vast majority of people who lost their insurance got it back within a year. It's like they're having uh, a whole bunch of people on the beach at a resort somewhere and uh, talking about the people who go in the water and the people who are sitting on the sand and, and making some kind of a statistical tortured misrepresentation that all of the people who were in the water at any time are the equivalent of those who are self-insured, even if most of those people were in the water for a few minutes and then left and went back to the beach. The kind of health care system we had before Obamacare, for the vast majority of Americans, it was something like eating dinner at a fine restaurant if you had insurance. In Britain, in Canada, under socialized medicine, it's like everybody eating dinner in an army mess hall. <laughs> Except for the people who can afford to still go to a fine restaurant. If Obamacare is ever fully implemented, we will have a two-tiered medical system. You'll have people who can afford it getting the hell out of that system because their time is valuable and they don't want to wait forever, and everybody else being stuck with that system. When the demand of something, demand for something exceeds the supply, the price mechanism creates an equilibrium by causing the price to go up. In this case, if it's socialized medicine, what they do in Canada and Britain is to ration usage with queues, with waiting in line. So everybody theoretically has access to medical care, except that you've got to wait a month or two months or three months for an MRI or to see a specialist. And that's the way it works in those other countries. So the people who can afford it get outside the system and pay additionally. That's where we would wind up going here. There's no alternative to it. it can't be any other way. Yeah. Would you, would you make a comment on uh, the movement on changing the Electoral College from what it is to uh, the majority in some states? Sure. <laughs> this is the Democrats' dream come true. In 2012, while Obama was reelected, you know that 30 Republicans won governorships in states? They didn't all win governorships, but after that election, there were 30 Republican governors out of 50 states. Republicans had control of more state houses, state legislatures, than Democrats did, even though Barack Obama got more popular votes than Mitt Romney did. We are a republic, not a democracy. The word democracy doesn't appear once in the Declaration of Independence or in the Constitution, but the Constitution guarantees us a Republican form of government. One of the reasons the founders created the Electoral College system was precisely not to have so democratic a process as a national popular election for president. They wanted someone who would get enough support to be president to have geographic support around the 13 states at the time, and now it's 50 states. Not just someone who can dominate in a highly populated region. California, New York, Illinois, those are states owned by Democrats. They win by huge popular vote majorities in those states. The Northeast is solidly Democrat. States like Colorado, we have seven members of the, the House and two senators. That means we get nine electoral college votes. You get one for each senator and one for each member of the House. Wyoming only has one member of the House, so they get three electoral college votes. So a low population state like Wyoming gets three electoral college votes, even though they only have enough population for one U.S. representative. It gives much more leverage to smaller population states, and the smaller population states tend to be Republican states, which is why the left is trying to come up with some kind of way of circumventing the electoral college. I'm not sure what the number of states is. It might be 17 or 18, maybe it's more. Uh, they have already signed up at the state level for what's called a compact of the states. And if they get enough, enough states who sign up, then those states can use their popular vote, not their electoral college vote, 
in order to produce the next president of the United States. And if there are enough states to constitute an electoral college majority, that will be the way it works. And in every case, this is being driven by Democrats. Now, the silver lining here is this is probably unconstitutional. There is a prohibition in the Constitution about a compact of states. It would have to be decided by, ultimately, the Supreme Court. <laughs> and if Obama gets to put another liberal on the U.S. Supreme Court, you know they're not constrained by the Constitution. They use terms like a living Constitution, which means no Constitution at all. This is the, the genius of Thomas Sowell in his book, The Conflict of Visions, that you've heard me recommend over and over again. He describes the, the leftist vision as an unconstrained vision, and the conservative vision as a constrained vision. And as it applies to the judiciary, conservatives respect the process. They respect the Constitution and the electoral process as prescribed in state constitutions or federal constitutions. The unconstrained vision, in addition to its notion that human nature is perfectible, Karl Marx believed that human nature was perfectible too, only perfect human beings who go along with collective socialism. In any event, the, the judicial version of this is the left doesn't want to be constrained by the Constitution. As a consequence, they think judges ought to be able to reinterpret the Constitution based on contemporary standards. When, of course, the founders provided for changing the Constitution, if anything became obsolete, all you have to do is amend it. Amend it, but you need a supermajority to amend it for obvious reasons. Because they were concerned about the tyranny of the majority which is why they didn't create a democracy, it's why they created a constitutional republic. So this, this uh, electoral, do away the electoral college idea is a terrible idea. Uh, if we were a democracy, we wouldn't have a United States Senate with every state having two senators. If we were a democracy, the Supreme Court members wouldn't sit for life, they'd be elected. Isn't it ironic that the liberals on the Supreme Court want to treat their, their powers as if this is a democracy, while they're protected in keeping their Supreme Court seats for as long as they want, precisely because we're not a democracy. No. So we need to, to fight any attempts to do away with the electoral college. Yeah. I'd like to recall election phenomenon that occurred in Colorado. It's a unique in that Kevin McCorn, I think in this case the recalls of Morrison and Maroney, yeah. I, I think that was a mostly a single issue recall, which is why I'm reluctant to draw any generalizations from it. Uh, Morse uh, was a political icon. He was elected in a district where he got less than a majority because of a libertarian in that race as well. Uh, Heron, however, was in Pueblo, which is a pretty safe Democrat seat in the Senate that she enjoyed. But those, those Pueblo Democrats uh, are rural folks who are probably Second Amendment advocates. Uh, they were less concerned about uh, Heron getting carried away as Democrats did in the state legislature and a lot of other areas. They were zeroing in on the, the anti-gun position. So that's just the way I analyze that particular recall. Yes? Okay. I'm told we are out of time. I'll hang around for a few more minutes if you want to uh, come up and ask any questions. Anyway, thanks for your indulgence. Party. I said, sure. So I had him on the show for an hour. 
And we had a really good, productive conversation. We weren't arguing with each other. We were just uh, exploring ideas or some areas where we differed, but it was very cordial disagreement. At the very, I should have quit while I was ahead. I'm looking at the clock, and I'm hearing my producer in my ear. Uh, there's only about a minute left. And I made the mistake of asking one more question. And the question was, uh, do you think it's possible that the Tea Party could move to produce a Republican nominee who is too far right? And I expected him to say, well, sure, that's possible. It's something we should avoid. There was a deathly silence for about 10 seconds. And then he said, no. That is, Tea Party influence couldn't possibly produce somebody who's too far right, meaning that nobody could be too far right. And he, the, the pause, what I interpreted the pause to mean was he was thinking, how am I going to answer this so I don't turn anybody off at the extreme of my Tea Party movement in Rattle County? Now, I couldn't read his mind, that was just my interpretation. And he said, no. And I said, well, thanks for being with us. <laughs> there wasn't any time for, for rebuttal. But, but I, I hope, I, I hope that there, we're able to get through to, to some of those Tea Party people that are indulging their purity, that they can put someone to the ballot that can't win. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, the end of our meeting for this evening. I'm